Okay, we're at the next step in the station project, and you can see that I have painted the parts on their various plywood sheets, all the parts that are supposed to be Kentucky green. And they're still on the sheets, which makes the painting an awful lot easier. You can imagine you would not want to be trying to paint some of these small parts once you took them off the sheets. Now about the color matching. In the last episode I talked about the PMS matching system and how I was able to convert that over into CMYK. When it comes to mixing paints, uh, one of the things you have to be aware of, although I got an exact match for the paint when I looked at it outside, when I looked at it under um, the hobby room lights, the, the, the layout area here, uh, it did not look like the green that I wanted. It was much darker than that, which was what I expected to see because you always have to tweak these things. You can't really depend on your first time out and matching a color is going to look right because it's going to be, you're going to be viewing it when it's finished under a different kind of lighting condition. So I finally got around to adjusting the paint and now I have a good match, as you can see here, for the Kentucky green. And you can, I don't know if you can see it very well on the, the tape, but there is a slight bluish cast to it and, it. and it matches very well what I've got in all the pictures of the uh, stations and what I remember. Now, when it comes to uh, the light on your layout, something to talk about here. Uh, these are the floodlights that I use on track lights to illuminate the layout. And I use LED bulbs uh, because they consume far less power. Uh, I have the layout room illuminated with about 20 track spotlights uh, and they're all LEDs and they only draw as much power as two conventional spotlights and they're completely cool and they last about 25 times longer so they're really worth the investment. But when you look, any kind of light you look at, first, one thing to pay attention to if you don't know about this is something called color temperature and you'll always find a square on the container that looks like this and it talks about light appearance and in here it talks about the color temperature and we measure color temperature in Kelvin okay so warm is 2500 Kelvin to 3000 Kelvin well all the bulbs I'm using in this area are 2700 Kelvin which means they tend towards the yellowish uh, shade uh, you don't notice that, the human eye doesn't notice it, but uh, when it comes up in photographs you'll see it and that's why you always have to do a color balance adjustment when you take color photography inside for incandescent lights because incandescent lights tend to run into the around 2700 to 3000 Kelvin range. All the way up with a cool, which is a very blue-white light, uh, that's around 5000 Kelvin. Uh, that's really not a comfortable light for a lot of interior illuminations for your layout room. So we always go with about 2700 Kelvin. It always gives a warmer, more comfortable look to it. And what that means is whenever you paint a structure or a, a piece of equipment, you always have to pay attention to the fact that the color is going to shift from its exact hue and you have to make adjustments. And that's what I did with this paint. I got it down to the point where I did get the bluish cast. I'm looking at it under 2700 K lights. And you can see there's a slight bluish cast. It's a gloss here, but there's a slight bluish cast. So with that, I'm going to be able to now match, be sure that I'll have a layout building on the layout that will look like the building in real life. And with that, we're going to conclude this little segment here. And then the next step, we're going to start putting things together. Okay, we're back working on the Union Pacific Station project. And just to give you an update here where we are, it's about a week later. And as I talked in the last thing, I finished all the painting, and now I have completed the basic assembly of the exterior walls. And you can see by looking at this, here is, here is the white wall in green, as in this, the illustrations of the station that I showed earlier. So that's coming together nicely. All the exterior walls are done. Of course, the hard part, the windows and doors, that comes a little bit later. Another part that is finished at this point is the interior supporting structure. Now this goes together, just as I said, with basically slots and tabs, and you don't really need to glue it. This is all held in by pressure here. Now I do apply a little bit of uh, Franklin's Tight Bond wood glue. I highly recommend it. It's far better than an Elmer's white glue. This is a real carpenter's glue. But I use it very, very sparingly, and it does give a little extra strength to it. And the outer walls will then be assembled into a shell that goes around this and slides down over the structure. Now in the instructions here, 
one of the things when you learn with kids so that, that people that write instructions write them in a sequence that they prefer to go with and you can often modify stuff as long as you follow all the steps where things go and what they're telling here is they're saying that first assemble your exterior walls into the shape of the station then accept, you know, put together the base and then the walls not being held together with anything but tension slide down over this uh, I'm not going to quite do it that way because I've learned with these kits you need a little reinforcement of the structures of the, the corners so I'm going to put each wall on here and use an interior brace to help keep it in square and that's the thing I'm going to glue but I'm not going to glue the walls to the base of the structure because at some point because you can see this this base is all divided into the the rooms and areas in the station I may decide to detail some of the interior and put lighting in it not right now but that's something I want to be able to go back and do there's another thing, the station up here, you'll notice, has, has two chimneys in it. And I've learned from experience that these are the only metal parts in the kit. There are two cast metal chimneys that I'll paint to look like brick and mortar that I've learned from experience that it's best to glue them from the inside. So having the ability to move the, remove the outer shell of the station off and glue the, the chimneys in is a, is a better approach. One other thing I'm going to do also slightly different than the instructions than the instructions say. When they talk about putting together the outer walls, they talk about putting the cupola, this this area right in front, where the dispatcher would sit, together with the walls at the same time. But that's that's these three pieces of wall right here. And there are four windows that go in here. Each one of these windows has a quite a number of parts. So I've learned from experience that when you deal with a part of a structure like that, it's better to assemble that separately so then you can get around and, and do the windows much more easily. So that I'm going to assemble as a separate sub-assembly and then fix it to the basic uh, structure of the, the building when it's done. And that will all come together and you'll see that in another segment. A couple of the things to notice here. Um, if you don't have one of these, I seriously recommend you get it. It's called a magna focuser. Particularly as you get up to a certain age, uh, even bifocals don't help on some of these things. And this is a handy little little deal. It fits down over your head, and you can just flip it down for close-up work. It's a very handy thing to have, and they're they're easily available. Um, as far as the working on the uh, building itself, another handy thing that I found, MicroMark is a great source of all kinds of tools that you don't seem to be able to get anywhere else. And one of the things that they sell at Micromark is this assembly plate. And it's a magnetic plate with a, with a whole series of magnets. And when you have to put something together that you want to keep at a certain angle and keep in square registration, this is a very handy thing. These magnetic plates stick here and you it's all done completely square and so you can line up walls if you want to assemble them separately from a structure and you'll be sure that they'll remain in square so with that I'm going to continue on the construction of the building I'm now going to be getting involved in building the, the outer shell putting it together making sure it's all nice and square and then assembling the windows now this so far represents about four hours five hours of work this is actually the easy part now we're going to get into the detailed part, and a great many of the parts, like these here on this sheet, these are all window assemblies, and you can see they're extremely small and very finely detailed, and that's what's really going to take time. And then after that, there will be the roof structure, which will be interesting. I'll talk about that in a later episode. So, back to the Union Pacific Depot project. Okay, now you can see that I've got the model in the uh, construction frame and the, the, the uh, right angle grid with the magnets and the walls are all in and I'm using the magnets to hold them in a square and I've actually stretched a rubber band around to make sure everything stays up nice and snug and this is the main part of the structure and here is the front part of the dispatcher's office cupola that I said I was going to put together separately because putting the windows in there while it's on the model is a little bit more challenging so I think it's easier to do it this way and this is going to sit in here overnight because one of the things I've done is I've put in here little corner pieces, just balsa wood, to help stabilize the corner. Now those are glued in to make sure everything stays at a right angle to give reinforcement. I've even put a few down at the very bottom of the dispatcher's cupola. So this is going to sit overnight and harden 
And then uh, tomorrow I'm going to start working on uh, the windows, which will be a very time consuming process because each window is made up of about a half a dozen or more parts. A couple things to mention here. Some of the handy tools you find working on models is one, dental picks. You can go to uh, hobby shows or uh, hobby shops and stuff and they actually sell these. They're recycled from dental schools. Uh, they're various shapes and everything and they come in really handy for moving the small parts and making adjustments and picking up small parts. You can just lightly stick them with the end of the, the pick and pick them up, particularly wood or plastic parts. And I find these very handy. I go through them quite a bit and they're very inexpensive. This is, this is actually kind of a deluxe set. It cost me nine dollars at a hobby show. But they're very worth getting. The other is this little device here. It's made by a company called Northwest Shortline and it's called the Chopper. And you often find yourself in a situation where you have to cut multiple pieces of wood or plastic and you want to cut them to exactly the same length you want to cut them square or at an angle. The chopper basically holds a single edge razor blade here and you have these various guides that you can line up at a 30 degree angle or 45 degree angle and you can see all the degree angles and 15 degree increments are noted around here and you just cut it. And it's a very handy thing to have. Uh, again, this is Northwest Short Line makes this. Any place that sells model railroad supplies sells them. So, I'm going to leave this overnight and let it harden. And then uh, tomorrow or the next day, start building the windows. Meanwhile, I'm going to go work on my control panel for the staging yard.